All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 14th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. Uh, a, a serious threat has reared its head again, only in a much stronger form. Uh, there is, had been a movement for some time uh, called Reconstructionism, also called Theonomy, um, Dominionism. The idea of Christianizing the world through taking over the government and imposing the law of Moses on the entire world or on a particular nation or whatever. To what end? That's the question. What would be accomplished by doing that? Was Israel, God's people, saved through the law? Can anyone be saved through the law? The answer is no. For by the works of the law, uh, by the works of the law shall no flesh be, flesh be justified right in the sight of God, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It just simply pronounces you guilty. It does not give life. Anyway, uh, because of the situation in the world and people are looking around for an answer other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, people who are call themselves Christians even, and are turning to the law of Moses as a solution— uh, these people are typically Calvinists, typically post-millennialists, typically preterists. In other words, they have mutilated the Bible just like dispensationalists in order to eliminate the things that don't agree with what they want to do. So we're going to take a look at a sample here. Uh, this is a, a young man named Jeff Durbin. He is the pastor at Apologia Church in the Phoenix, Arizona area. Uh, James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries, a well-known apologist uh, and internet presence for many years, uh, left uh, Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church to go over to Apologia to join Jeff Durbin and joined with the uh, theonomy and postmillennialism and preterism also, apparently. And then, because of uh, James White has a number of friends inside the Southern Baptist denomination, um, he's hooked up uh, some of them with Apologia and also the notorious theonomist Doug Wilson up in Moscow, Idaho. The uh, well, what do you call him? He's not a Presbyterian. He's not Reformed. He created his own denomination called what is it? Rec, something like that. Uh, as a uh, a shelter for the outcasts, because the uh, legitimate reform denominations cast him out a bit as a heretic, had to do with the Auburn Avenue theology. Um, what's his? Where is that book? Okay. Never where I need it. He wrote a book called Reformed is Not Enough. And he, uh, he argues in that book for the objectivity of the covenant. In other words, uh, people are put into the kingdom of God by baptizing them as babies. Uh, and that was not acceptable in the Reformed denominations. And he also is wants to put follower of Rush Dooney and... Uh, Greg Bonson and others wants to put the entire world under the law of Moses, which is going to do what? Well, just stir up sin. That's what it does. Uh, it, where there is no law, neither is there a violation, and sin is dead. But when the law comes, sin becomes alive. 
because it has something to rebel against. So you're going to try to impose the law of Moses on unregenerate sinners. Not only that, you're going to try to impose the law of Moses on regenerate saints. And we won't have it. So let's listen to this a bit and see what this uh, Christian nationalism is all about, which is just rebranding theonomy. Uh, let's let's make sure that we get away from the whole like modern evangelical wishy-washy squishy <laughs> i'm a pastor i don't get involved in politics well then you're failing sorry politics and really so a pastor that's not involved in politics is failing so if he's preaching jesus christ and him crucified which seemed to be the mission of the apostle paul was, was Paul involved in politics? Was Peter involved in politics? Was John involved in politics? Was Jesus Christ involved in politics? Hmm. Do you have a different version of the New Testament than I have? Perhaps. Ages in legislation, which is the imposition of morality. And if legislation is the imposition of morality, because it is, what is legislation? It's saying you ought to do this, and you ought not to do that. That's an ought. We're saying you must do this, you must not do that. It's morality. And if True, except when it's actually for other purposes, like immorality. <sighs> so, morality saves how many people? The law saves how many people? It converts them to Christ? It makes them new creatures in Christ. It changes the heart. Imposing a law on someone changes their heart, perhaps. Interesting con concept. I don't find that in the Scripture. I find something that denies that. The need for a new covenant that actually changes the heart because the law had no power to save. The law is obsolete because Christ came with a new covenant that actually saves people and transforms their heart and gives them a new spirit. The law is obsolete because it never could save anyone. It only condemns people. If legislation is about morality, then the question must be asked, does King Jesus have something to say yeah. about morality? And really this... Okay, let me tell you something. When you hear people talking about King Jesus rather than the Savior, Lord Jesus, you can almost bet they're a theonomist. They're almost bet they're a Christian nationalist because they want to impose the rule of the law on the world without the king even being present. That's called a usurper. You know, like King John in, or Prince John in the... Uh, in, Robin Hood, he wasn't the legitimate king. He was a brother of the king. And he usurped the position of the king, who was actually held in a far country at the time, Richard the Lionhearted. It's called a usurper when he takes somebody else's throne, like the pope. He's a usurper. He has stolen the throne of Jesus Christ and set himself on the throne. So that's what Theonomus are going to do too. They will set themselves on the throne of Moses, or call it Christ, and impose their rules on you, just like the Pharisees did, going beyond the gospel to impose law on people. Uh, not good. And some of us will not tolerate it, but, well, they'll try to eliminate us. Question comes down to, do you really believe— Using the power of law. We'll just outlaw you people and, well, do what they did to the Anabaptists. Give them the third bapti baptism in the deep six. Uh, permanently baptize them in the middle of the river. That Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords today. If you really believe Psalm chapter 2, the nations are Christ. God's going to give them to all to Jesus. The inheritance is the earth, the ends of the earth. If you believe that all the kings of the earth are... All right. Uh, this is, he's taking you down a narrative that's false. If you study the book of Revelation, you'll find there's a point where uh, Christ is praised because he has taken up his scepter 
And the King James says raised and reigned. That is not a proper translation. It is uh, what's called an ingressive aorist. King James just took it as a simple past tense. It's not. Uh, as you'll, if you look in the New American Standard, you'll see that it's a it has begun to reign. Uh, that which is a, which is a proper translation of that. So at that point, Christ has taken up his scepter and begun to reign. He's busy doing something else until that point. What what, what did he commission his apostles to do? To go into all the world and preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations. Did he say, take my throne and rule and reign over the earth while I'm absent? No, he sent them forth to proclaim Christ and salvation, the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. So who would want us to be diverted from that into something else? It doesn't matter what else. Who would benefit? Um, qui bono? Who would benefit from diverting Christians from proclaiming the gospel to the ends of the earth? Hmm. I think we all know who that would be. You're supposed to obey Jesus and kiss the sun. Then what does a nation look like that does that? Yeah. How exactly. do they legislate? Like if, if the legislators are actually God's deacon, if that's their God's servant, and they're supposed to actually serve the true God. Now, the requirements for a deacon are different than the re requirements for a president, because a president doesn't have to be saved. A deacon in a church does. They must be regenerate. In fact, the original requirements given in the book of Acts was to pick seven men who were filled with the Holy Spirit. When have we ever seen anybody full of the Holy Spirit in the White House as president? Nope. God? Then what does it look like when they do? Uh, let's let's make sure that we get away from the whole like. Okay, that's that's a, these silly uh, shorts just keep running on and on. So that's Jeff Durbin of of Apologia. He's rather notorious, and you certainly don't want to be on a town council or anything when he's in the area, because he has a habit of, uh, well, harassing people, and he has uh, well he likes to make himself known through harassment. So he'll go and harass the town council about not outlawing abortion. Of course, they have no authority to do that while videoing, videoing the whole thing. So they have like three cameras there and showing this, this great and mighty man harassing a city council about something they have no authority to do anything about or harassing the police or whatever which there's, unless he's taken those videos down, he always considers, you know, that, that a, a real act of courage to go out and, and do things like that. He's very much into anti-abortion and, and all those things. But did Jesus tell us to do anything about that? Did Jesus do anything about that? Did the, did the apostles go out into the world seeking to change the culture? We need to ask those questions. If the Bible is our authority, now, if that is not your authority, if uh, something else is ruling and reigning in your heart other than Christ himself and his word, well, that just indicates where it's coming from. So let's take a look at what God has to say. What is our priority supposed to be? This is a quote from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 54 through 56. And when his disciples, James and John, who Jesus had named Sons of Thunder, saw this, the, the, a village re, uh, did not accept Jesus. Uh, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? Well, I don't think Elijah's purpose was to destroy a village. <laughs> if I remember the context there. So what if, what would, how did Jesus respond to this? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So Jesus' purpose in coming was not to judge, not to destroy, but to save. He's coming in, a judge, in judgment next time. He hasn't come yet in judgment. 
Mr. Uh, what's his name here? What's his name? Jeff Durbin believes that Jesus actually returned in judgment in 70 AD. He believes he's a preterist. He believes that Jesus returned and judged in 70 AD and fulfilled all the prophecies in 70 AD. That's what a preterist is. Uh, sometimes they, are, they believe part of, part of the prophecies were fulfilled, sometimes all of it. But I think he's pretty much a full preterist and a post-millennialist. In other words, the church has to build the kingdom of God and take over the world for Christ, and then, and only then, can Jesus come back, and then they'll hand the, king, the keys over to the king after they've conquered the kingdom, kingdom for him. <clears throat> okay. Okay, let's look at a, another statement from the New Testament here. Jesus in Matthew 24, this is verse 11 through 14, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. So the end of the age is brought on when the gospel is preached in all the world to all nations as a witness. So who would like the gospel not to be preached in all the world as a witness in order to avoid the end of this age coming? Hmm. Let me think. Who was that? Who is that? I don't know. Maybe he doesn't even believe. I, I'm sure Durbin believes that Satan is currently locked up in the bottomless pit. So he doesn't go about deceiving nations anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what Durbin believes. I don't really care what he believes. He's a pain. He's an enemy of the gospel of Christ because he's preaching a substitute gospel, a different gospel, which is not the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the mission of Jesus Christ. His, Jesus didn't send us to save the governments, to, to change the, 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 put a new coat of paint on the Titanic. He sent us to save the people off the Titanic before the boat goes down. But not these guys. They want to, to do a remodeling of the Titanic after it's already hit the iceberg, which happened 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden. No, no, we just need to remodel the ship a little bit better. Let, let's, let's, let's create some better regulations. We'll, we'll pass a law that prevents the water from leaking in the boat. Yeah, we'll, we'll cure sin through the law of Moses. What kind of theology is that? Where does the Bible teach such a thing? Where does the Bible ever teach that anyone can be righteous through the works of the law? Any sinner can be saved through the law. Only Christ fulfilled the law. Hmm, very strange indeed. So let's take a look at uh, another passage here. So Jesus said the gospel of the kingdom, that's the same as the gospel. There's, not, well, there's only one gospel, salvation by the grace of God through faith in Christ, and that alone. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 28. This is the Great Commission, uh, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, you, you heard Durbin saying that, well, Christ the king, he has all the authority. Therefore, we should be putting all the world under the king. But what did Jesus actually say? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go, therefore, because he has all the authority. So what are we supposed to do with the authority of Jesus Christ? Make disciples of all nations. Not convert entire nations either, out of all nations. Make disciples of them, of individuals from all nations. Bringing them into the kingdom of God, to God's particular people, uh, his holy nation, his royal priesthood, as Peter quotes. Because that is the people of God on earth. We're not of them. 
He calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He doesn't say go out there and, and wire up some light bulbs in the world. He says call them out of the darkness into the light of Christ, into true salvation, not into playing around in politics, which is utterly worthless, doesn't solve any problems, can't save anyone, never has. Corrupted a lot of people. Killed a lot of Christians, too. A lot of Christians have been martyred by governments. Why? Because, well, they're evil. Not the institution of government, but the people in them are. God ordained government for the world, not for the church. Christ is our government. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is our mission because Christ has all authority until the end of the age, until the gospel has been preached in all nations as a witness. Then the end of the age will come. This is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Uh, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a blasphemer and a persecutor of, and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love that are found in in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. So here Paul gives us Christ's mission statement when he came into the world. He came into the world to save sinners, not to execute sinners. He came into the world to save homosexuals, not to stone them to death. He came into the world to save murderers, not to execute them, to save kidnappers, to save rapists, to save all kinds of sinners, lovers of money, church members even, to save sinners. What does the law have to do with saving sinners? Imposing the law of Moses, which is obsolete anyway, has nothing to do with salvation or the gospel or Jesus Christ at all. Who would want us to turn away from Christ and his mission in order to serve the law and politics and the world? Who would want us to do that? Jesus? I don't think so. Ah, I got to take those off. All right, so that's uh, what's, what's, that's what's going on in uh, Christian nationalism. They, they've sort of, because the word theonomy has such a stigma attached to it, Reconstructionism has such a stigma attached to it, Dominionism has such a stigma attached to it, they decided to relabel themselves something that would appeal to Trump supporters and people generally in the world, in the United States, that are not particularly religious, but they're Americans. And they would, if you gave them a choice between are you a Christian, a Muslim, a, a Jew, a, 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 or an atheist, or Hindu, or Buddhist, which one would you pick? What are you? A lot of people would say Christian, right? Are they really Christians? Does the Spirit of Christ dwell on them? Do they truly believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins with a saving faith, divine faith? Um, Probably not. (laughs) Probably not. But they would identify with it. And, you know, just like all the the Trump voters, it's not too hard to sway them. You just just say, we're going to make America great again. We're going to convert this into a Christian nation. And that's been going on for a long time. There's been many famous preachers that have pushed that idea for, well, way back in the 1970s. And, of course, before that, you had Rush Dooney. When was he doing it? Well, 
Well, oh, yeah. Rush Dooney, uh, this is copyright 1968, the foundation of social order. This book has nothing to do with Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's no gospel in this. Uh, this is imposing a, a law version of Christianity. And this is a, a, a minor publication. He did a whole set of books on, on law. Um, and they're, they're just too expensive to buy. So then it goes through different iterations. This is Greg Bonson. He died, I think it was in his 40s. I think I said 30s the other day, but I think it was in my 40s. This is copyrighted, uh, first edition, 1977. Theonomy was picked up by people like Pat Robertson of the 700 Club for a while, too. They, they were pushing these ideas, uh, taking it. Well, he ran for president, if you remember. And he lost, of course, because how many Americans would want Pat Robertson as president? Uh, is it not a big potential gathering there? So who else? Bonson. Uh, now, this is this is the Bible of Jeff Durbin and company, uh, James White. To all the elders there have to subscribe, apparently. This is the mission statement, according to Jeff Durbin. James White had to read this book to become an elder there, apparently. And he's into it. James White is really into this stuff. He's left Christ for theonomy. This is uh, a guy, a Canadian named Joe, usually called Joe Boot, Joseph Boot. And this was, uh, so uh, this is stuff. Now, you also, on the edge of these things, you have people like, these people are all Calvinists. And Calvinism does not make a real clear distinction between the Old Testament and the New, nor does it make a real distinction between the law and the gospel. Because that's the way they are. They think the, the law is grace, too, just like the gospel is. Uh, so they're, they have a built-in, confused system, just like dispensationalism brings you into a, a confused view of the Scriptures and God's purpose and everything else. Anything that distorts the Scripture by imposing a view on it is to be avoided. Let's see, what is the date here? There's a copyright page. Oh, here it is. 1988. First published in Canada in 2014. Mm, currently second edition. Ezra Institute, 2016. And he's currently making the rounds. Uh, you'll run it into him uh, talking to in... Uh, group podcasts with Durbin and James White and others. And you also have people out there like uh, A.D. Robley, uh, Doug Wilson from Moscow, Idaho, is a big one in this. Uh, he was into, uh, he's considered an aberrant, uh, reformed. He created his own denomination because he was outcast. Yeah, you maybe want to consider some of those things. But this is, before it was just like, it was like the Pentecostal movement. Once upon a time, it was in the little ramshackle church on the other side of the tracks. And then in the 1960s, it broke out into the mainline denominations as the charismatic movement. And then the uh, the... Some of the Pentecostals, like the Assemblies of God, has actually exploded worldwide uh, because they offer power. They don't actually manifest it, but they offer it. They they claim that you actually have the power to do things that you you want, and, and it's really— I don't want to be too hard on the Assemblies of God, but the extreme example is people like Kenneth Copeland, where you actually have people out there— and some, many of the prophets and apostles, commanding God to do things, believing that their words 
have supernatural power and if they have faith in their words. You know, Jesus said, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast in the sea and do not doubt in your heart, it will happen. It will do it. That's true. If it's the will of God and he gives you supernatural faith, yes, you can do that uh, because it's God's will. As John says, if we ask anything according to his will, we know that we have it. We ask according to the will of God, we're just cooperating with God. We're not doing anything out of our own strength. But they believe, like Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin before him, in the power of words. So you can literally create things with your, wor- with your mouth, with your words, and combined with your faith in your words, not in God's word, in your own words. This is called sorcery. This is an occult technique. This is nothing new. If you went to an occult bookstore and you looked into a lot of things, in fact, the occultists, uh, some of the famous ones like uh, Blavatsky and others, uh, Alice, what was her name? Alice something or other was another one of the the Theosophical Society cultists. Uh, They recognized when the Pentecostal movement came on the the scene that these were our, our kinsmen, our cousins, because they were doing the same things there as the occultists were doing. I bet your Pentecostal pastor doesn't know that. Yeah, Alice Bailey, Alice Bailey, yes. The Theosophical Society, which used to be located in Rockefeller Center. And the address was 666. How do these things come about? I don't know, but it was, indeed. I mean, if you looked in the book, it was right there in the in the forward where it had the where it was published and who it was published by, and it had the address right there, six 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 Rockefeller Center. I think definitely was six six six. All right, so that that's a good sign, right? Yeah, that that definitely wants you to, as a Christian, read that book. But there, there's these Satan is always trying to deceive Christians and feed them his garbage. And theonomy, what is, is that? Because think of how, how did Satan destroy Adam and Eve in the garden? He did. He killed them. Killed them spiritually and all their descendants. Actually, God committed all the descendants also under sin for a reason, that he might have mercy on all. The God of Calvinism is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is good. The God of Calvinism isn't. Uh I don't really want to get into that now, but yeah, I I dove in that for a while and said, no, this water is really stinky. I got to get out of here. Their, their idea of God is just, well, blasphemy. They, they blaspheme God. God doesn't do what they say he does, like ordain sin in exhaustive detail. There's a video out there. Uh, there was a debate uh, with James White about... Uh, about that issue, and I can't remember the guy's name, asked him a question in the debate. Did God ordain the rape of a child? And James White boldly said, yes, of course. And that's what gives it meaning. That's not even funny. But that, that is the, the true Calvinism at its core. Most Calvinists don't, aren't aware of that, so... Don't condemn every Calvinist for their ignorance of the evil that's in the core of Calvinism. And it's deeper than that even. But, uh, you know, these guys, that's what these guys are into. Along with some personality disorders here and there. (laughs) But this stuff is, uh, which drives them. Drives them. They're not driven by Christ. They're not driven by the gospel. They're driven by something else. They're driven by Satan. They serve him. I'm not saying they knowingly serve him, but that's what they're doing because they're turning people, they're turning Christians away from the gospel into a worldly agenda, trying to make America a better place rather than saving sinners, which is Christ's agenda. When Christ returns, he'll fix the rest. 
But until then, his agenda is calling people out of all the world into his self, into, onto himself to be his people. The world, well, he'll deal with that when he comes as judge. As judge. But now he's still in the saving business until the gospel has gone out into the ends of the world. Then the end will come. The end of the age, not the end of everything. So... We need to, uh, as Paul says in the King James, mark these men and women, mostly men. And again, almost all of them are Calvinists, and avoid them because they are dangerous. This seems to be affecting the Southern Baptists, which is the largest non-Catholic denomination in the United States, particularly because they're wishy-washy and they do have a chunk of Calvinists there. Uh, it is not, I don't think it's affecting the, the fundamental independent Baptists, which are probably as large, if you count people that actually attend church every Sunday, and probably larger if you look at how many missionaries they send out, especially if you count how many missionaries that actually go out to plant churches and preach the gospel instead of doing social welfare work or uh, proclaiming social justice and equity kind of stuff, which doesn't save anyone either because that's of the world and a distraction. So Satan doesn't care what you do as long as you're not doing what God wants you to do. He'll give you a whole, whole menu full of options, except there's always one missing, and that's what the one thing God wants you to do. But this is growing because of the lawlessness of this age and people falling away from faith. They are turning to these useless, worthless things like the law of Moses in order to try to fix the world. Turn America back to God. Won't work. Make America a Christian nation again. America was never a Christian nation. That's a myth. If you know, actually know history and know the kind of Christianity was, that was around and how many people, say, in, New, in Puritan New England, how many were actually members of a church? A small minority. In fact, you had to be pretty, well, they didn't like Christian people to join the church. Uh, you had to, to, to jump through a bunch of hoops and had to give a convincing testimony to prove you were of the elect. Of course, you never can actually prove that. You never know until you stand before Christ. Oops, no, you weren't really mine. Sorry about that. I, I chose you for some other purpose. See that flaming mess over there? Go jump in it. That's, that's Calvinism, really, it is. And that's why this kind of nonsense, this law-based non-salvation, finds a, a ground to grow there. This weed of, of theonomy or dominionism or Christian nationalism finds a home there because that God in Calvinism is not the God of the Scripture. It's a different deity altogether, really. Uh, different, not the care. No, they don't. <sighs> they uh, they don't believe that God truly desires to save all people. They don't believe that God truly loves all people. They don't believe that Jesus Christ came to the world to die for the sins of everyone. Jeff Durbin doesn't believe that. James White doesn't believe that. But that's what the Bible teaches. That is what the Bible teaches. So you can either chase after uh, Jeff Durbin and uh, put your trust in the law of Moses to fix the world, or you can follow Jesus Christ 
and receive the free gift of eternal life. Your choice. Your choice. But the law can never save you. It can only damn you.